let's talk about Docker and how you can use it to improve your productivity in a data science project. First, let's start with a true story that I um, personally experienced. I saw a very nice uh, repository on GitHub uh, with some cool data science things that I wanted to try. So I cloned it and I tried to run it and I got this error, right? Computer says missing requirement, this and that. And after some hours of debugging and stack overflowing and 30 open tabs later, I still couldn't fix the error. So I eventually uninstalled Python 3 on my computer, I uninstalled Python 2 on my computer, and this is a true story. And even two days later, I still could not run the code. And finally, I, I just gave up. I'm sure many other people have encountered this uh, problem with uh, dependency management as well. And um, another story that you might have experienced yourself is that you know, you've written some code and you spent some days on some uh, project and you wanted to now finally share the results with your colleagues. And when they try to run it on their machine and it just, you know, uh, you get an error. So uh, it's so common that XKCD, SKCD even made a comic out of it. On different computers, people have different versions of Python and this and that. And uh, running code um, across machines is just quite difficult. And, and that's the problem that Docker solves. So in this video, in the next few minutes, I will talk about what Docker is in a nutshell, a quick crash course. And I will show you how I typically set up a Python project using Docker and share some principles um, that I use in dependency management. I'll show you some common commands that um, is good enough for me. There's a, there's a lot to Docker, this very deep uh, tool with a lot of configuration options and a lot of things you can do. But I find that um, just with a few basic commands, you can do um, probably 80% 80, 80 of what you need to do. And I'll talk about the benefits of using Docker the gotchas and share some resources for you to learn some more if you're interested. So Docker in a nutshell, right? So imagine um, you have a friend who has a garden and a bed and he or she tells you like, hey, you know, it's great, uh, weather's nice, you know, just put a futon in the garden and you will, you know, enjoy, uh, you know, the nice weather, right? So you decide to do the same. You put a futon out in your garden and Next thing you realize, you know, there's flies and it's hot and it's humid. And so the problem here is that the environment is different, right? For your friend, it is in very specific um, conditions that the futon is, is, is encapsulated by. There's weather, there's no flies, this and that. And in your particular environment, it, it's not the same, right? And so that's what Docker tries to do. It takes the one thing you, that you want to do, which is to relax on a futon and it encapsulates it, gives it, a, the container wraps everything it needs uh, for that futon experience, you know, your aircon, your jazz music, whatever it is. And that's what a container does um, it, um, uh, in Docker. It takes a process, isolates it, and all of its dependencies into a one self-contained unit that can run anywhere as long as uh, Docker is, is installed. So process is a big word, right? So um, for example, um, running a Flask app is a process. Running a unit test is a process. Running a Jupyter Notebook server is a process. So whatever it is that you're doing, um, you can use Docker to uh, wrap all the dependencies at either at the operating system level or at the project level, uh, all within this self-contained unit that you can you know, share, share um, with your colleagues or put on the cloud to deploy. So that's uh, Docker in a nutshell. So I will show you um, how I would set up a typical Python project. So this is the repo. You can clone it and um, code along. So let's run the first command to build our image, what, what we call a Docker image. And I will show you how this works under the hood. Oh, OK. Uh, it's complaining that Docker daemon is not running. So there's a common gotcha. I need to start Docker. Docker daemon needs to be running for Docker to work. Okay, now the wheel has stopped uh, spinning and we can again try to do Docker build. Okay, so now it's done building and let's uh, break it down. Right? What did this command do? So first of all, 
Docker build, uh, this dot is saying, uh, telling Docker to look in the current directory for a file called Docker file. And I will go through that shortly. And dash T is shorthand for tag. So it's to tag this image with this name, uh, my project. And so let's look into set a Docker file. So think of Docker file as a recipe. And you are telling here, telling Docker using this file to say, do this and that to create that image. Uh, so first thing we do is to take from a base image. So we take from Python 3.6, for example. So it would already have Python runtime. It would have all of Python's dependencies, like maybe GCC or you know, whatever other operating system level tools. So you don't have to worry about that. Now this um, Docker image abstracts away all of that complexity for you. So you just need to pull and you have Python straight away. And if, if you want to upgrade the version of Python, you simply look up Docker Hub and find the right version for you. These blue uh, keywords are what we call Docker commands. There's a lot of them, um, but these are the few that typically are used from day to day. So if you want to run any bash command inside this Docker image, you say run. So you can run uh, echo, hello, or something. Anything you can run in the terminal, you can run it uh, here. So typically, we just update the uh, Ubuntu OS dependencies. And work there is saying, uh, set my default working directory as code. So later, when we read Docker run, you will see that by default, you go into this directory called slash code. Copy is taking everything inside here, dot everything inside here, and put it inside this directory so that you can uh, work with it inside or you can run the code. And next thing we do is simply to install the dependencies. And you notice there's no virtual environments or anything like that. Uh, you could create one if you want to, but since this container is only used by us, our project, so we can directly install it on the, um, the container's uh, Python mm, environment. Okay, CMD is shorthand for command and it's saying by default, when I run this container, just start a bash shell. Um, you can change this to you know run your main program, for instance. Uh, but right now we just start a bash shell so that we can go in and you know run anything we want. Run your unit test, start your Jupyter notebook, and so on. Okay, so that's Docker build. Now we have the container, we can run it. So I will explain the options shortly, but let's just run it first. And as you as you saw just now, as I mentioned, work there is now by default code. And what is inside here? You notice it's the exact same as our project here. That's uh, for two reasons. Number one, we copied it over. And this is static, meaning that during build time, whatever you have inside here will be here. If you add a new file, delete a new file, it won't show up here. But uh, that's not nice when we develop code, right? So that's why we have this dash V option. V is short for volume. That means that uh, whatever I have here in PWD, which is my current working directory, I will map it into the code directory, which is inside the container. So again, this is our, my this is my laptop, my host OS as they call it, and this is the Docker inside the Docker container. So now, if I were to create a new file, you would uh, immediately see it inside uh, here, and that's thanks to this uh, dash v option. And there are many, many options again, and I'll just show you the ones that are typically used in the data science project. Another one is P. Uh, it means something else, but I think of it as port. So you're exposing uh, port 88888, which is what Jupyter Notebook uses, um, onto the host as 8888. So if you don't expose it, then you won't be able to access it. Um, but if you do, then you can run a Jup um Anything that runs on this port, 8888, will be accessible uh, on the host at the same uh, port. Okay, so that's available. Now, if I, didn't, if I didn't expose it, then you will see that whatever is running inside the container will not be accessible outside. On, the, on your host, okay? So that's what the dash P option does. So in this Docker container, you can treat it as if it's your computer, like you would run it on your host, 
um, whatever you run, you can also run it inside here because it's all the dependencies are all specified here. I install a library called Nose to run unit tests. Or you can, uh, you know, as I show you just now, start a Jupyter Notebook. And the best part is that now, to share this with your colleague, to get it working on another machine, they simply need to do three things. Install Docker, build, and then they can run. So uh, the dev productivity is increased uh, greatly. You don't have to manage uh, how to install Python 3.4 on your colleague's computer or you know, manage all these uh, different host-level dependencies. And just a short word, if there was any other tool that I need inside um, this operating system level uh, runtime, I would install it here. So, I, so my principle of, think, of thinking about this is to separate uh, what I call OS level dependencies and project level dependencies. So OS level dependencies are all stated inside Docker file. Um, for example, if you need, I don't know, Vim or something like that, all of that you will install uh, inside here. And project level dependencies, I would put it all inside requirements text. So if I was trying out a new library, I don't know, mock or something, I would put it here so that when my colleague clones this repo and runs it, immediately uh, all, of these will, all of these project level dependencies will be uh, there in the Docker container. Because Docker, uh, when we say Docker build, it will install everything stated inside requirements text. Every time I add a new dependency, I would need to build again. But otherwise, if I change source code, there's no need to build again. Just, uh, just keep running. Just uh, keep running it here, and you know, do whatever you need, and it would just work. This brings me to the benefits of uh, using. Uh, Docker for data science projects. So first things first is to start on the right foot, right? We know that this project is going somewhere or even if it's just a kind of experiment, a quick proof of concept, you also probably want to have it run on uh, somebody else's machine or deploy it somewhere. So by starting right with this uh, Docker template or a, a Docker setup, you ensure that you don't waste time, you know, three days later or two weeks later trying to backtrack like, okay, what version of NumPy did I install uh, in those two weeks when you're working on this thing, when you install so many dependencies, all of that is version control, it's reproducible, it will just work uh, as long as your colleague has uh, Docker installed. And second benefit is that it can be lightweight. So the container that we built just now was just uh, a few hundreds of mega, I think a hundred something megabyte. So in contrast, something like Anaconda would be 6 gigabytes, or Miniconda would be at least 1 gigabyte. So uh, it takes time to install, takes time to you know, download. So Docker is much more lightweight. And uh, it's portable. It works across uh, Mac, OS, uh, Linux, Windows. And with uh, more recent tools like Kubernetes or uh, Fargate, it, when you containerize an app, like a Flask app or a Jupyter server, it's simple to deploy. Um, you just need to docker run it somewhere on uh, some machine. You don't have to you know, worry about configuring or installing all these OS level tools. Uh, you simply need to do docker run. As long as your deployment target has, can run docker, then you can uh, you know, deploy what you've built. And um, another big win is uh, production light environments as early as possible. So one problem that I've heard many people encounter is that you spend weeks and months building something on your computer or on your team's computers. And finally, when you deploy it, you realize that, oh, it's deploying on a Raspberry Pi that didn't, doesn't have this and that, or it's uh, deployed on a Linux machine that uh, doesn't have Python 3. So th then a lot of bugs start emerging because the, what you've built, what works for this software, uh, won't work because the deployment target doesn't have those dependencies. So by using Docker, so if you know your deployment target, um, you know, only has uh, Python 3.4, so you can simulate it in your laptop, your computer, by starting with a Python 3.4 image, and then any of those bugs that might happen in a Python 3.4 environment, you would already discover early and you know write code to fix that. And uh, most importantly, no more environment pollution. Um, as I mentioned in my first story just now, when you install uh, one thing, you might you know, affect another project, this and that. So when we have this Dockerized setup, if what works for this project uh, will not pollute or 
change or break another project that I have on the same computer. And your colleagues will certainly thank you for this. And just some quick gotchas. Uh, IntelliSense and Autocomplete uh, for your, from your IDE um, uh, will be a, a little bit more challenging because your IDE cannot read the Docker containers uh, environment. But there are workarounds, and in my other video on IDE productivity tips, I will talk about how you can do that. And Docker Desktop uh, doesn't run on all Windows uh, OSs. You need at least uh, these versions to work. So if your colleague works on Windows 7 or any versions less than this, then uh, it will be impossible to run Docker Desktop. Um, I might be wrong on this, so if you know otherwise, please leave a comment in the, uh, uh, below. And uh, lastly, getting containers to talk to each other involves a little bit more work. There are other tools like Docker Swarm or Kubernetes uh, that was, or Minikube that will solve this problem. But uh, from my experience, if you're building one service, you're building like uh, data science, you're writing some data science code to run a Jupyter server, uh, containers is more than enough. Uh, but then if you need to get it to talk to some other services, another Docker container, then uh, you need more work. But uh, from my experience, in a data science workflow, typically this is not a problem. We typically have one container running one process, and yeah, even if you need to run unit tests and Jupyter and a Flask at the same time, you can do that within one container, right? You don't need to talk to another container for this. Um, yeah, but there are workarounds for this, as I mentioned. So that's all. Uh, if you're interested, these are the links. Um, you can read more and learn more about this uh, uh, using Docker to improve your productivity.